Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Rooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and on behalf of the entire team at the Chamber, uh, we hope that those joining us are uh, feeling safe and healthy in, in these unprecedented times. Uh, at the Chamber, we view our role to, uh, as informing, as convening, and as advocating. Uh, and like many of you, um, while you're continuing to do the core things that you do, you're doing them in a very different way. And that certainly uh, speaks to today's Government Affairs Forum, uh, which we would normally do uh, in person, but today uh, we're doing it virtually. And uh, we're welcoming uh, Massachusetts Senate President Cameron Spilka uh, as the Chamber's first Government Affairs Virtual Forum. Uh, so my welcome to the uh, Senate President, Senate President, we're joined by more than 300 people on this call today, including many of your colleagues in the Massachusetts Senate. In fact, looking at the list, I think we have a quorum if you want to get some business done <laughs> on the call today. Uh, as we continue to adapt to this unprecedented time, uh, I know that the Senate President shares the Chamber's passion for making our state the best place for all businesses, and all people to thrive. Uh, since taking over the office of Senate President uh, in 2018, Cameron Spilka has followed a very collaborative approach on numerous issues of importance to the business community, including transportation, education reform, as well as, as, well as bringing people together uh, in a very inclusive way to talk about the way that uh, taxes and revenues uh, are collected here in the Commonwealth. Uh, Senate President, we're very fortunate to have you with us today, albeit virtually, and we look forward to hearing from you in just a moment. Uh, but first, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, I want to begin with a huge thank you uh, to today's sponsor, Bank of America. Uh, Bank of America has been our longstanding partner and sponsor of the Government Affairs uh, Forum series, helping us bring relevant content uh, and speakers like the Senate President to our community. Uh, and we appreciate that support, but at this moment, I wanna give a special thank you to Bank of America um, for the role they're playing uh, in helping everyone deal uh, with this pandemic crisis. Uh, bank of America has been part of the fabric of this community and supportive of so many causes throughout the Commonwealth, uh, led by Massachusetts President Michal Chamberlain over the years. Um, but in this time, they've really stepped up helping process small funds set up by both the governor and the mayor. Um, so I want to give a big thank you, not just for sponsorship today, uh, but for the role they're playing during this crisis. Thank you, Bank of America, and all of the members of the business community that are stepping up in such a big way. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be streamed on Facebook Live. Um, also shared on the Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. Uh, I think we're all getting used to using Zoom, but um, please submit your questions throughout the webinar using the chat feature on your screen. Uh, or if you've dialed in or want to, you can also email questions in uh, via Chamber programs at bostonchamber.com. I will turn it over uh, to the Senate President for some remarks and then we'll come back and uh, have a Q and A uh, period. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over uh, with gratitude for joining us today to Massachusetts Senate President Cameron Spilka. Thank you, Jim. And with gratitude, thank you for inviting me here today to speak with you. I hope this message finds all of you who are here as well, all of you and your families are healthy and well. That's the most important thing right now. So I'd like to especially thank Jim and Board Chair Paul Ayub for this invitation. And I wanna thank all of you for your ongoing efforts to engage and guide both business and political leadership during this very challenging time. As we all know, the spread of the coronavirus in the United States, and with it, the declaration of the state of emergency in Massachusetts, has created a situation unlike any of us have ever, ever seen before. At the state leadership level, Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, and I have been truly united in our belief 
that our first priority is the health and safety of our residents. And in saying that, I would like to thank all of the frontline healthcare workers who are caring for those who are sick, whether with COVID-19 or another illness. I also applaud our healthcare infrastructure that we have here in Massachusetts. It's amazing. And it was able to be mobilized to meet the demand, especially now that we are still in our surge. I'd also like to thank Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters for their response to this crisis and their communication with the legislature throughout this process. I'd like to thank Speaker DeLeo and acknowledge him for his partnership. We are getting bills done and on the governor's desk in an expedient manner that will help our residents, communities, and our businesses respond in co to COVID-19. And I'd also like, with a big, big heart, thank everyone in the Senate, the senators and all of our staff for their hard work which is allowing us to have a very inclusive, thorough, yet very thoughtful process to still pass great bills. Our immediate concern is the public health crisis and doing what is necessary to keep people safe. But our long-term goal and our challenge is to address the economic fallout of this unprecedented situation. And this work has already begun in the Senate and will continue clearly for quite some time. The Senate has adopted a new normal by being as nimble, proactive, and communicative as a chamber designed hundreds of years ago to be a deliberative body can be. Starting on day one, it's about six weeks ago, it seems like six years ago, I'm sure, uh, starting though on day one of this crisis, I immediately formed a comprehensive Senate communication and involvement plan, including a very robust COVID-19 Senate working group, ably led by the Senate Chair of Public Health, Joe Comerford. This Senate working group is tasked with identifying, prioritizing, and making recommendations on how to respond to immediate issues related to COVID-19. It functions also as a communication structure that allows senators to raise issues of concerns from their communities so they raise issues up, which can be either passed to the subgroups, we have seven or eight subgroups of, of the working group, uh, and they can take possible legislative action or raised to me to bring to the attention of the administration. Thanks to this structure, senators can then quickly disseminate information about our work at the state level, also back to their respective communities and businesses and constituents. Communication among members of the Senate is of paramount importance to me. So the Senate uh, working group sends out, we have been sending out a daily bulletin summarizing all of the work of the working group, the Senate, uh, the legislature, the bills that we pass, important news of the day, uh, information on, on what the governor is doing. We send that out every, you know, every weekday to all senators. This, the working group also offers briefings to the entire Senate on issues of importance. We've had briefings on preparation of the surge before it started. We, had, we are having a discussion with medical experts in the field of epidemiology to explore our path forward out of this immediate crisis. And this is actually happening as we speak. We also had a recent briefing with AIM on economic issues facing small businesses. Again, making sure that all senators have the information they need. And as a Senate, we have continued to meet weekly or sometimes even twice weekly, either as a Democratic caucus or as a whole Senate, to discuss legislation and other issues of importance. 
and we have instituted a call network. I've instituted a call network that I refer to affectionately as our buddy system. So there are several senators that have uh, sent other senators that they call or text every single day to see what issues are p popping up, what the information maybe they need or questions they need answered, and just touching base to make sure that there is that, that involvement in communication so that we are all in frequent communication and definitely involved. It has been my priority to ensure that senators and staff have up-to-date information, resources, and support that they feel they need to be helpful to their constituents. And as I mentioned, that all senators have the same information. I'd like to highlight some of the things that, that we have passed. So since early March, the Senate has, has provided $15 million in funds to deal specifically with the COVID-19 crisis. We've waived the one week waiting period for unemployment benefits. We postponed municipal and our special elections. There's two special elections in the Senate, two in the House, and we expanded by a lot early voting and vote by mail options for those elections. We passed a bill to halt evictions and foreclosures. It's, this bill is the strongest moratorium in the nation. I'm very proud of that. And this bill will be helping renters, homeowners, small businesses, and nonprofits. We passed a bill to expand the scope of practice for healthcare providers, ensuring that we have the needed healthcare providers uh, and that the residents are protected. We passed a number of measures allowing for increased flexibility on the municipal level. We've waived the MCAS requirement for this school year and allowed for the adjustment of the competency determination process. I hope you all know that we also extended the personal income tax deadline from April 15th to July 15th. And the Senate addressed the need for changing changes to the nomination signature threshold. We provided medical liability protections. We continued to address related issues to unemployment, including and this is important, making sure employers' experience ratings are not affected by the current crisis. And just last week, we passed bills allowing for virtual notaries, strengthening local and regional public health systems, and providing assistance for vulnerable populations. In addition, Speaker DeLeo and I released a statement addressing the disparate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on communities of color in Massachusetts. And we continue to work on this. So as you can see, we are continuing to work very diligently to address the needs during this crisis. Obviously, the, uh, a very pressing issue at this point for all of us is what is next? What, what goes next? And I have to say the honest answer is we simply don't exactly know yet. But as I have stated many times before, periods of change and uncertainty provide us with periods of opportunities. And I can tell you that the Senate plans to take those opportunities to be intentional about how we move forward. When it comes to opening up the state and deciding when it was safe for all of us to leave our houses, let me be clear. We will rely solely on the advice of healthcare and public health experts to ensure we are acting in the best interests of our residents. But we will also be working clearly very closely with the administration and, and the House, but relying upon economic experts business leaders like you and our partners in local, state, and federal government to support our economy as we move beyond the immediate public health crisis to what probably I believe will be needed as a phased-in reopening. 
We began this week a few weeks ago, this work a few weeks ago, when Senate Ways and Means Chair Mike Rodericks, House Ways and Means Chair Aaron Michaelwitz, and ANF Secretary Mike Heffernan convened an economic roundtable where we learned that experts are predicting somewhere between a $4 billion to $6 billion revenue drop, $4 billion to $6 billion deficit. And although I remain extremely proud of the three plus billion dollar rainy day fund, the highest we've ever had, one of the highest in the countries that we've built up over the recent years, it's clear that there's no going back to the old normal at this point. I was chair of economic development during the last big recession and I remember how tough it was and the bill that we passed in 2010 to help kickstart our economy was the result of listening to what businesses, workers, and those looking for work felt they needed. And I plan to take that approach again, and I will rely a lot upon Senate Chair of Economic Development, Eric Lesser. So far, we know we need more support for our small businesses. After pushing our federal delegation in the last two weeks, and I know all of you did as well, I'm glad that they recently passed federal stimulus bill included more funding directed towards minority and women-owned businesses, as well as rural and truly small businesses. But there will be more biz small businesses that will fall through the cracks. And I hope you will let me know what more can be done to help these businesses as we move through this? Last week, the, sent, the, the chamber held a panel discussion with CEOs to understand what it will take to get back to work. And the point was raised that healthcare and higher education, big pillars of our economy, are taking a particularly tough hit as the result of this crisis. I agree that we must pay close attention to these two sectors and use this as an opportunity to reimagine what they will be as we move forward. This is true of so many of the issues facing us, including the big issues that we were grappling with even before this crisis hit, such as climate change, transportation, healthcare, mental health, and others. In healthcare, the Senate has consistently been a leader on expanding access to telemedicine. And when this crisis hit, we were so grateful to see this happen and we hope it stays. We were also ready to quickly pass the expanded scope of practice legislation to address the needs of healthcare professionals during this crisis. As for transportation, the Senate was looking at policy approaches to our transportation crisis that would influence behavior. We said that time and time again, that actions that the Senate takes need to influence and change behavior with the goal of getting people out of their cars and onto public transportation. As mentioned in a recent Globe article, which included thoughts from Jim, it is likely that people will be slow to return to public transportation until they feel 100% safe. We should use this time when it is deemed safe to return to work, but before we are back to full capacity to do the much needed repairs to the T, the commuter rail, the RTAs, so we can get closer to delivering a public transportation system, an experience that our residents deserve. To that end, I have asked Senate Transportation Chair Joe Bancori to work with his House counterpart to hold a joint oversight hearing so we can hear from our transportation experts on their various thoughts and plans to open our state's transportation systems, including our public transportation our T, the commuter rail, our RTAs, and our roads and bridges as well. 
employers also must continue to encourage working from home. Now that we have all learned, some of us somewhat reluctantly, how to hold video conferencing meetings and encourage staggered start times, also as noted by Jim. Doing so may help our congestion problem just long enough for us to fix some of our major transportation woes and begin updating our transportation system. I also want to stress that the Senate still plans on passing a transportation bond bill with the hopes that the Baker administration can move quickly on important issues, transportation issues and projects once it is safe to do so. Continuing to allow employees to work from home will also help us meet our emission goals, which is especially important because we definitely do not want to go back to the old normal when it comes to climate change. I believe that this gives us an unexpected opportunity to lay the groundwork for generational change when it comes to, when it comes to climate change. And so I hope the House will take up our next generation climate change bill and that we can get it to the governor's desk before the year is over. In addition, I haven't wavered at all, not a bit from my belief that the people of Massachusetts deserve to have a mental health care system to be as routine and accessible as regular health care. And I hope to see momentum on the Senate's mental health ABC Act also. When I spoke to you last year, I mentioned that every policy issue we face this session is also an economic development issue, and that is still true. Since then, an issue that has risen to be a pressing economic development priority due to this crisis, and for what I think you'll all agree are obvious reasons, is that of childcare. I think I speak for all parents when I say that any phased-in reopening plan must start with preschools and childcare so that parents with young children can take advantage of this childcare option. I was speaking with Senator Warren recently, and she framed the issue of childcare this way, which I so believe in. She said, basically, if you think of the concept of infrastructure as what is needed to get people to work, you must consider childcare part of our infrastructure. It's as important as roads and bridges and public transportation. We've all read the stories, including the Globe article this weekend and an editorial in the BBJ last week, on how difficult it is for two parents to be working full time from home while caring for their children. The COVID-19 crisis is unprecedented, to be sure, partly because the workforce has steadily shifted to include dual income families for the past 50 years. But those of us have, who have worked a long time to help ensure economic activity and opportunity for all of our residents have known that child care is simply vital, especially for single parent households. And so I'm hoping that we can use this moment of increased awareness of the importance of reliable quality education and care, early education and child care to raise it higher on our priority list. I'm very proud of the work Massachusetts has done on K-12 public school education through the Student Opportunity Act. And we have been steadily working on the need for increased funding for our public higher education. But it is clear that it is time, the time is now for meaningful action when it comes to early education and care, especially since we know from the research just how important early education is to creating successful students, which become 
our successful and qualified workforce of the future. To be clear, the state will not have the capacity to fully fund universal earlier education and care on our own, giving, given our current budget situation, no matter how much we may want to. So in the same way that we have partnered in the past on issues of importance to all of us, including transportation, climate change, mental health, and others, I am hoping that we can begin a conversation on convening a public-private partnership to address our early education and care issues and needs. Because after all, we are in this all together. As I have said many times, if any state can come out of adversity and be stronger for it, it is Massachusetts. I love this state and I am so deeply appreciative of our can-do spirit, our willingness to help each other, and how quickly we have come together to tackle the big challenges that this crisis has presented. At the Chamber event last week, Michu Spring of Weber Shanwick made what I believe is a really good point. She said we should be thinking of going forward to work rather than going back to work because so many things will be different. The new normal will be hard in a lot of ways, but it will also be necessary. And as we create this new normal, we must do th so through a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework in every single aspect of our economy and our civic life. So thank you again for all that you do. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forwarding, forward to continuing working with all of you as we go forward to work. And I'm happy to take questions at this point in time. Thank you. Hey, well, uh, thank you, Senate President, for such a uh, comprehensive conversation about uh, a lot of things that are on your mind, as well as uh, your colleagues in the Senate. Uh, you hit on so many issues and the questions are, are flowing in, but uh, you know how much I like to talk about transportation. Um, so just a- Near uh, and dear to my heart too, so yeah. let's go. Um, I, I, I look forward to working uh, with Chairman Boncori on, the, on looking at sort of the ways to come out of, uh, come out of this. Um, uh, transportation, as you said, has been on the minds of everybody um, before this crisis. Now it's on the minds of everybody during this crisis as they contemplate, how am I going to commute to and from work or wherever I'm going? Will it be safe? Uh, so I appreciate you focusing on that. Um, a very practical issue I think that's before you is the governance of the MBTA. Um, uh, the, the control board um, legislation expires, I think, in June. Um, so you'll have to think about uh, how to address that. Um, so do you expect some form of legislation then by the end of the term related to that and maybe some other issues? I'm hoping, you know, um, as I think all of you know, the House did two separate transportation bills. Uh, I have asked uh, Senator Boncori to uh, be meeting with uh, the committee as well as, as I mentioned, the experts to figure out uh, the best way to go forward. We've had some initial conversations and he is continuing to talk to people, meet, you know, meet virtually, of course, with people. But um, I, I think that it's time to convene a virtual oversight hearing to really get a feel from the experts and people uh, as to wh what way they believe is best to go forward. But I am hoping, I'm still planning on doing a transportation bond bill, an $18 billion bond bill. I don't believe we can kick that down the road anymore. We can't kick the can down the road. We need even, you know, either despite or because of the, the uh, crisis, um, you know, the Senate hasn't changed its priorities. We still believe a transportation uh, bond bill is important. Um, as I mentioned, climate change, healthcare, mental health, housing, hopefully. 
uh, it just needs to change the lens that we look at these issues possibly uh, uh, somewhat. And that's where experts can help us and maybe refocus a little bit. But uh, I, am, I, am, I believe and I am hopeful that we will be able to continue to pass some of these major uh, bills and ma tackle the major issues. Um, uh, Senate President, you, um, you mentioned the way that the Senate's operating and the structure you've set up so that people can communicate with each other and get things done. And I applaud uh, you, the Senate, the legislature for the things you've been able to get done that, that you listed. Um, you've been a champion of inclusion in the public process um, as these uh, legislative matters get deliberated. Um, talk about how uh, in this virtual world, um, being able to uh, allow for some form of public process and maybe a second part of that question, um, how are you and other senators communicating with constituents and hearing sort of what's on their minds during this time? I know that's another thing that um, uh, uh, you treasure, uh, feedback from um, the, the constituents in your district as do other senators. Senators, any interesting tactics that uh, that you're using to get that feedback? You know, um, first of all, I thank you for uh, acknowledging my, my background is conflict resolution. And, you know, as a labor and employment attorney, uh, arbitrator, mediator, I really, and I still believe that the uh, precepts and concepts of conflict resolution apply not only uh, in those fields, but in any field. And the more input you have, uh, from different people and take different perspectives. It may take a little longer up front, and I know you know you practice this as well, Jim. It may take a little longer up front, but the final product is always better. It's more thoughtful. It's been vetted. It's a better final product. But you also have included inclusion of people, and so they feel a part of the process, and you have a better chance of having success with whatever that, that product is and a more successful outcome. So, you know, we practice that in the Senate on various levels. And uh, I think overall that senators feel really good about what they're doing and they are working really, really hard, both still on committee work, they are processing bills, they are filing bills related to COVID-19. Uh, even though most of the bills have gone through the committee process, there still are some and new bills are being heard. Um, I know uh, in the election laws committee, Barry Feingold and his committee, Senator Barry Feingold will be holding a, a virtual hearing on uh, the elections bills, the uh, mail-in ballots and, and potentially new ways for ab absentee, even though they are limited by our constitution. But, you know, to hear those bills, they will be virtually held. They are, there will be, and I think it's really important to be live streamed so the public can watch and hear what's going on, uh, to have the capability to submit electronic testimony, written testimony, uh, and maybe even to have an opportunity like in the economic summit where if somebody is testifying, they can be heard and watched during the live stream. You know, the one thing that, that we have learned in the State House, though, is that we have, uh, we are limited, unfortunately, by our technology. We, we have not invested in our technology. Um, and that is one thing that we need to look at for uh, uh, in the future. Um, and I'd like to do, once this is behind us, sort of do a debriefing with uh, senators and, you know, everybody to find out what their experiences were. And how can we make that better, not only for the senators and their staff, but for the public? You know, how can we be more accessible, more transparent? How can we share more information so that people better understand our processes? You know, with constituents, a lot of people are uh, making phone calls. Social media has become a, a big way to, to contact and, and uh, either to contact our constituents or um, you know, get feedback. I know I've been making a weekly video of, you know, sort of the week behind of what the Senate has done, the week ahead. Um, I have my trusty rescue dog Lincoln as part of that, thinking maybe, you know, it'll get some attention and people will focus on him and, and watch to hear what is going on. I think that's important. 
uh, for people to know what we are doing in state government. And, uh, you know, I think that, that people are doing it in a lot of different ways. We are trying to support them from the Senate President's office. Uh, but, you know, people are also just making phone calls, sometimes contacting people, you know, in their, in their area, the leaders, whether they be local officials, business officials, uh, nonprofit, you know, leaders, and just what's going on, healthcare, how are you doing, to just really touching base. And I know that all of the staff are doing the same thing. And I'm very proud of this, everybody in the Senate because they are really uh, working overtime. Um, Senate President, you mentioned um, some of the waivers you've been able to put in place to enable um, different elements of our community to operate. Um, Foremost among those, for example, telemedicine, enabling that to take place, um, the remote notary. Um, some of these already existed in other states. Some of these were being considered um, as permanent in this state. Um, would you think some of these things that have been waived for the pandemic period um, might be allowed to continue into the future? Uh, several questions are particularly interested in telemedicine. Yeah, I think we definitely need telemedicine. And I think that this will show, this time period will show folks that not only does it work, but it is needed. It is needed because there's so many people that cannot go to the doctor as easily. They either don't have public transportation, they're sick, they, they, they need help. And I think that uh, this will really show uh, hopefully the whole state, including the legislators, that uh, telemedicine needs to be here to, set, to stay. We need to make sure that all areas of our state have access to broadband and internet to ensure that all areas can do it because it's especially important. Telemedicine is, is important for all areas of the state, but especially to those areas where the healthcare uh, providers are a little bit further away and it's hard to get there because of either not sufficient transportation or, you know, whatever it might be for the barriers to get to a healthcare provider. Uh, sometimes that, that first contact of telemedicine uh, will make the difference and we absolutely need to keep that going. And this is where, again, as I mentioned in my speech, that we need to look at this crisis as an opportunity. What has worked? What should we keep? What should we even develop further? And the new normal is gonna be different and has to be different than the old normal. Um, several questions on higher education. Um, um, one about generally the higher education system, public and private, um, and in what ways, um, government can help sustain and reopen that important part, um, not just of our economy, but of the fabric of who we are. Uh, but particular questions around our public education systems uh, and um, the struggles that they're having now and will into the future in terms of uh, the way they're funded. I know that uh, there's some federal funds available, but there's also um, some um, gaps that will get created out of this situation. Uh, in terms of their operating costs and maybe even related to their debt service payments, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, any thoughts on the higher education um, situation and how we get back to uh, go forward? How we go forward with the new normal, yes. yes. Uh, going forward to work, going forward to education. Um, you know, I think that there will need to be some sort of package uh, to assist the public higher ed in particular. Uh, one of the things that I am hearing some of them are really looking into are continuing to develop their online capabilities so uh, that students can take classes a very in a robust manner next fall if need be online. So that's one thing where uh, I, I definitely think that that's an important aspect and will be uh, even, again even more so in the future for uh, public higher ed and any higher ed actually. Um, I think that get, we'll again have to see getting going forward 
to school, uh, how a reopening would look for these, these schools. Maybe, you know, looking at dorms, uh, looking at classrooms, cafeterias. In the fall, we may very well still need to have this six feet social distancing. Dorm rooms may need to be just single rooms. I mean, th these are all things that I will rely upon uh, our presidents and chancellors of our higher, you know, public higher ed institutions to work with us and get back to us how they reimagine a uh, potentially new system depending upon where we are at um, the end of August, September. Uh, there are some federal funds that will be available to the schools. We're still figuring this out. Hopefully there will be more funding on the federal level. Remember the federal government can be uh, in, in debt. We cannot, we have to have a balanced budget and we only have one bucket of revenue. Um, so, but I do agree that there will be some gaps that we will possibly need to help our, our public higher ed uh, as they go forward as well. But this is true in almost any area, and this is why you know I strongly urge all of you listening to this uh, to to contact your federal delegation. We do need more assistance. The state government needs more to help our our small businesses, our vulnerable populations, our higher ed, our, our ed, whole education system, our seniors, uh, our veterans. I mean, the whole, the whole system needs assistance. Our local governments need help. And, uh, you know, so our businesses, small businesses will continue to need help. They need to uh, assist us more. It's as simple as that. Um, Senate President, one of the hardest hit uh, sectors in our economy, as you know, has been hospitality and tourism. Um, they were hit hard coming in. It'll probably be a long uh, uh, period of time to get them back to the uh, whatever is going forward in that industry. Um, but coming up on us is our seasonal um, uh, hospitality and tourism industry down in the Cape, out in the Berkshires, so many beautiful places across this state and uh, that rely on the upcoming uh, couple of months. Um, any thoughts about, you know, how we can be helpful uh, uh, with them when it looks like um, uh, the summer months will be very impacted? Right. I think of ways to help them explore what a reopening might look like to each industry, whether it be a hotel or a restaurant or what can they do? We, I, I think we will need to social distance at least for the next couple of few months. Um, so what does that look like? What protocols can they put into place for them to start thinking about it? Uh, masks, you know, clearly if you're eating, you can't, if you're sitting at a restaurant, you can't be always wearing a mask, but you know, how will that work? Will they be, will they sit, you know, leave every other table empty, every two or three table? I mean, how, so to start thinking about how, how will that work, I think uh, is important. Um, you know, what might their needs be? Will they need their own uh, personal protection equipment uh, that they probably do not have right now? And as you know, the federal government has been um, almost non-existent in helping us and, and all the other states with our personal protection equipment. The, the term PPE has become a household word uh, because of this crisis. Um, so, you know, what what are their needs, and then how can we help set up, um, you know, either guidelines, regulations, if need be. I know we'll be working very closely with the administration, who will be setting up a. a, a a group to, to, you know, we'll all be working together to uh, look at what reopening, and I do believe that a phased in reopening will be important so that we can, for various reasons, touch on some of the industries that can deal with this first, uh, and what are the supports, whether it be certain levels of beginning to increase service on the T, or, and what will be needed for that, you know, will they need to sanitize it? much more frequently. Uh, will we need to hand out masks? I don't know, you know, but we need to start thinking about this so that because we do need to plan on getting our, our state up and running again 
and our economy going and, and over the, over time with a phased in approach people back will they need they probably will need childcare and early education so people can actually get back what changes and protocols do we need in, to put into place to make sure that is safe not only for the kids that are there but for the workers as well so you know we don't have a playbook for any of this so that's why you know, it's going to take a little time, but I do want to stress if anybody has thoughts or ideas, feel free to forward them on because again, we don't have a playbook. We need uh, all of our all of your bright minds to to help us as we plan this going forward. Well, um, Senate President, speaking of not having a playbook, um, you mentioned um, the projections of the revenue gap that the Commonwealth uh, is facing. Four to six billion dollars, uh, probably. That's conservative. Yeah, um, probably the toughest thing on your plate that will require some gut wrenching uh, decisions along the way. Um, how do you frame that challenge? How do you tackle it? Um, talk about that. Talk about um, you and and other leaders have have thankfully done such a tremendous job building up our reserve funds and the rainy day funds, that's there. Think about philosophically the management of that and the use of it. How do you begin to use that? And in doing this, this is a session that expires July 31st. You think you'll have to extend the session? Um, I believe there are certain things that we need to get done and the budget clearly is a part of it. Uh, we, we will do what we need to do to, to get the budget done. Uh, I believe, and I've said it before, unprecedented times need unprecedented solutions. So even though in the past, usually the governor does uh, his budget in January, the House does theirs in, in April, the Senate May, and then June is the time the House and Senate hash out the differences and present a final conference committee budget to the governor. Uh, I am hoping, and, and I know uh, two chairs of Ways and Means, Chair uh, Rodericks, Chair Michaelwitz, and the Senate, uh, the uh, Secretary of ANF, uh, Heffernan, are working together. That is also unprecedented, and I applaud them. I think this is what we need. Uh, the, again, getting back to working together for the good of the Commonwealth, uh, the entire Commonwealth. and. The only way we're going to be able to resolve this is if we all roll up our sleeves and work together. So uh, there are thoughts and, and they're exchanging ideas as to how to present a budget going forward. Clearly, uh, once we have the April revenues or unfortunately lack of revenues, uh, maybe next week we'll have an idea of at least where April fell because March the revenue wasn't really touched by the crisis. April, the revenue will be. Remember, generally we, we get our taxes in on, in the middle of April. Uh, so it will be dramatic. And I think that uh, we'll need to take a look. And when you asked you know, the use of the rainy day funds, the word that comes to my mind is judiciously. They had the, the, the funds there, have to be used judiciously. There's only one amount, one money, and it's going to take a long time to replenish whatever we use. We're hoping that we can work out this fiscal year, which ends June 30th, without having to either cut or hopefully tap into the rainy day fund through making some changes and adjustments. Um, and and using Medicaid funds in in you know great ways and uh, there, there are things that we can do to set uh, protocols and processes into place. So we're hoping that fiscal year 2020, what we're in, we do not need to either make many, many cuts or I'm hoping we do not need to take out of the rainy day fund so we could use it for next year starting July, for the year starting July 1st, fiscal 2021. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this will be a challenge and, you know, I believe that we need to start talking about it. We need to hear from our cities and towns so that they can plan as well. They have their uh, budgets to prepare before this fiscal year is out. 
and I do believe that we need to give them as much certainty as early as we possibly can as well. But, you know, so we'll see. The, I do believe the budget this year will be different than any other year. The process. Um, do, do you expect to need to extend the legislative session and are you considering month to month budgeting? We're considering everything. You know, I, I believe nothing is off the table, nor should it be. Uh, we will take a look and see. Some of it will also depend upon what what June looks like. You know, I, I feel like May will be mostly uh, somewhat of the way April was, maybe a little bit better. Uh, but June, July, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But at least from the Senate's perspective, nothing is off the table. Okay. Um, one of the um, uh, remarkable accomplishments that you and the uh, speaker did together uh, was the Student Opportunities Act. Um, and uh, it was a great moment. And I think that your ability to bring together um, various stakeholders and constituencies and put something in motion at that time was uplifting for all of us. Um, how do you think about that now? Um, oh my God, <laughs> um, how do I think about it? In the early 2000s, I ran for the state legislature in order to change our education funding formula. I felt like it was inadequate and inequitable and needed to be changed. I had no idea what I was doing or what I was getting myself into. I had been on the school committee of Ashland, my hometown. Uh, I was chair and I had formed a statewide coalition to figure out how I could bring people together to build consensus about the changes so we could then start lobbying the legislature. I had never set foot in the legislature at that point in time. Uh, and when the House seat opened up, within 10 seconds, I knew I was gonna run to change the education funding formula. I didn't know that it would take 18 years to do it uh, to accomplish the Student Opportunity Act but working with so many other colleagues and uh, it was great. I feel really good about it. I think it's a terrific bill. I think it truly addresses the problems and concerns for our students across our state. Uh, I think that, that with the increased funding for uh, low income, for ELL students, for uh, students with disabilities and helping communities, with healthcare needs that wasn't even a part of the funding formula in 1993. I think this will, number one, truly start getting rid of that achievement gap, that persistent achievement gap that has been there all throughout these decades, despite us putting so much more money into the funding formula and to school districts. Finally, I, I believe we'll start seeing that, that coming down that achievement gap and hopefully the goal is to get rid of it in the near future. I think it will help all of our students and I, and I believe that it will help have a positive impact on every single school district. Uh, we also looked at other ways to fund uh, giving more charter school reimbursement and more funding for uh, students with special needs. So, it's a great bill, uh, uh, the work of so many people, and I applaud uh, the legislators, the advocates, the business community that all came together to help get this passed. I'm very proud of it. You should be. Um, uh, you, know, you know, you mentioned that um, the answer right now to so many questions is I really don't know. Um, and you know, that, that speaks uh, for all of us, uh, we really don't know. Um, talked about a gradual reopening and the need to be careful and listen to the public health officials and so forth. A um, lot of discussion about, you know, could this come back in the fall? Could we have a, another surge period and so forth? Um, how do you think about reopening while at the same time perhaps preparing for or trying to avoid that happening? Um, another surge in the fall? 
I think all of us think about that, whether you be a, a public elected official or, a, you know, working a business owner or working at a business, planning on reopening your own business, schools, you know, whatever, nonprofits, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that that's why I think we need to do this somewhat slowly and plan uh, a phased in approach in my mind makes the most sense so that you start reopening certain areas, certain uh, sectors, and wait a couple of weeks and see how that works. Uh, wait one to two weeks or whatever. Um, but you also need to plan if people are going back to work in a large building, how do they get there? If they work on the 31st floor, they probably are not going to want to walk up and down the steps all the time. How do you deal with even just the elevators to keep people socially distanced and safe? You know, what, what do you do? Um, I think um, that there's, uh, so we need to give people time to plan out their own individual and unique circumstances. Uh, but, you know, clearly there is the concern of a surge. You hear that by all of the health experts. You know, again, another household name is Dr. Fauci. Um, you know, so that everybody knows, you know, what, what he looks like, who he is, um, and have the great respect for him. He has been truthful in, during this time period. Uh, and I think that we need to be able to, to plan and, and be honest with each other that we have to be wary of another surge. Uh, we need to let our healthcare providers over time go back to their uh, ways of, of eventually elective surgeries and other things that they have put on hold for right now. So uh, working together, and that's why a task force is the best thing, getting people from healthcare providers, various businesses, uh, local, state, municipal, I mean, just all uh, different backgrounds to talk about problems, concerns, and to help plan a, a phased in reopening. Well, um, uh, Senate President, um, I'd like to just ask you one closing question. Um, if you think about the people listening on this call, uh, specifically the business community, um, you know, how can we help you? How can we help the state uh, work through this crisis? And as you're thinking about these many issues that we've talked about today, um, just, yeah, how can we be helpful? And I thank you for that question. Some of it I responded to during or stated during my 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 speech. Um, I know it's easy to feel overwhelmed by this crisis and all of the hardship and sickness. Um, we all, I believe, know people who have had COVID nineteen. Some of them have not survived. Uh, and it's really, really hard. It's very hard, both physically and mentally, emotionally, to be isolated for so long. So first of all, I urge all of you listening, take time for yourself and your families. That is so needed. Make sure both your physical health and your mental health are being taken care of. I think for you to function fully to your capacity, you need that as well. I know I do, and, and, and so do we all. And, and taking care of your families, that's so important. I think that for each one of you to think about what you can do to help us go forward back, go forward to work, and what will be necessary, whether it be in transportation, uh, to get people into your offices? Can you stagger your work time? Can you let more people continue to work at home? Uh, I think a lot of businesses have realized how productive people can be truly working at home. Uh, what can you do? What can you do to support your employees? Can you help them uh, with their dealing with the transition back to work? whether they be dual income, single income, or single parent, you know, what needs to be done. This will be a hard transition. I, I, I don't believe otherwise, but I do believe, as I said, that Massachusetts is uniquely positioned 
we have such a strong sense of, of ourselves and of who we are and working together, I truly believe that not only we, will we come out of this, but we as a, as a community, as a state, will come out stronger. But we need your help. I clearly, as I mentioned, I don't have all the answers, but if each one of you has suggestions and thoughts and ideas, please feel free to forward them on either through Jim in the chamber or directly through us. Whatever works, don't ever hesitate to reach out. We need your input, we need your thoughts, and please stay healthy and stay well. Well, Senate President Karen Spilka, um, there were many dimensions of leadership in a crisis and uh, on this call and throughout the crisis, you've certainly demonstrated many of them. Transparency, clarity of message, empathy. Um, thank you for that on behalf of the Boston Business Group. Uh, before I close, I wanna highlight a couple of upcoming virtual programs. Uh, the next event in this um, Return to Work or Moving Forward uh, series will focus on return to commuting. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, today. So on Thursday, May 7th at 1 p.m., uh, we'll be joined by Secretary of Transportation Stephanie Pollack and the General Manager of the MBTA, Steve Poptak, uh, to talk about some of these issues uh, of, of returning to commuting. Our next Government Affairs Forum will feature Speaker of the House Robert DeLeo on Thursday, May 21st at 2 p.m. Uh, for his annual address uh, to the Chamber of Commerce. You can register for these programs and learn more about the activities of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce uh, at bostonchamber.com. Once again, thank you, Senate President Spilka. Thank you to all of the people who joined us today. Uh, that concludes today's Government Affairs Forum.